Hello, we're going to be in probably one of the most uh, pivotal chapters in the book of Genesis for understanding why the world is in the mess it's in. And that, of course, is Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13 today, which try to set the stage for why is there evil and suffering in our world. So before I get to the text, I want to, I want to do a brief uh, theological overview of the origin of evil. And it may surprise you the Bible doesn't discuss the origin of evil very much. Matter of fact, there are just illusions here and there that we have to draw inferences from. No clear, definitive teaching passage. Let me deal with the biblical material first. Genesis chapter 3 presupposes a previous rebellion in the angelic world. You might want to see Jude, verse 6. The angelic conflicts seems to be alluded to and I'm only saying alluding because, uh, as you know, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, we, we get much of our understanding about Satan and the uh, pride that caused him to fall. Uh, in context, is the king of Babylon, the king of Tyre, but it goes far beyond human authority there. Man is affected by the pre-existent evil in the form of temptation through the serpent. Now, I'm going to get into when I get in the text of why it just doesn't say Satan, but it says a serpent. It seems to be a literal animal. The Bible does not discuss the origin or purpose of evil. Isn't that surprising? It discusses extensively God's love for man and his provision for the removal of evil uh, and redemption, but does not discuss origin and purpose. It is assumed that evil has a purpose, or else it would not exist in God's creation. We are not saying that God is the source of evil, but we are saying that evil has a purpose. And I want to sh uh, show you for a minute, if I could, I guess one of the best books on the subject of the origin of Satan, the development of Satan, and there is a development, is The Theology of the Old Testament by A. Uh, B. Davidson, published by T. N. T. Clark. Um, we don't find an arch enemy um, in the Old Testament. We find a servant angel to apparently give man an opportunity to choose. We see that in the book of Job so clearly. Uh, we don't even see a personal evil uh, discussed until we get to the, to the prophets. Um, and the intensification that occurs in the apocryphal books, and by the time we come to the New Testament, Satan is an arch fiend, an enemy, uh, with a host out to thwart God's plan. But that is not obvious in the Old Testament. Um, Adam's sin affected all of creation. Now we look at Genesis 3, 14 through 24 for the Pacific curse and how it affected man and woman and creation. We see some of this very clearly when I think is a definitive passage on original sin in the New Testament which is Romans 5, 12 and following and we see that all creation suffers because of man's sin in Romans 8, 18 and following. Now, let me do some historical development. And basically, I got this from one of my very favorite systematic theologies. This is Systematic Theology by Burkhoff, and it is really a very good book. It is extensively indexed by scripture texts and by subjects, and it, it often shows you the historical development, which is so important us understanding um, subjects like this. Historical theological development. The first one to really discuss the fall of man and its implications connected with Adam would be Irenaeus. Isn't that surprising, someone that late? Now, the rabbis, it may surprise you, but they don't hold to original sin. They hold to a view of the Yetzer Hara and the Yetzer Hatov, the evil impulse and the bad impulse. But it is obvious to me in certain scripture texts, particularly uh, Psalms 51.5, uh, Job 14, 15, an allusion in Job 25, uh, that there is evil in the world uh, beginning with Adam's rebellion. Um, let's see. By the way, I was going to mention that Irenaeus set the stage for the Western church fathers that emphasized man's fall through Adam. Now, the Eastern church fathers... Uh, really kind of de-emphasize the connection between original sin and man's volitional sin. And so uh, Pelagianism is going to grow out of the Eastern Church 
while Augustinianism becomes the major theme of the Western Church. For an alternate view, Origen, and he's very early, of course, Origen of Alexandria, maintained that each man's sinned voluntarily in a previous existence, and therefore he came into the world flawed. But he didn't base it on Adam's sin, but on man's volitional sin in a previous existence. That didn't catch on very well uh, at all. Uh, during the Reformation, the major Protestant reformers, uh, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, followed more an Augustinian position. Um, but a very important theological element in the church came from Arminius, who was a semi-Pelagian, which means he, he, he realized there was a connection, but didn't make the total connection that Augustine seems to make between Adam uh, and the sin of all men. Uh, Pelagianism, which of course is that uh, the fall is not connected with man, that man chooses completely. Pelagianism during the Reformation was pretty much um, in the realm of the heretic uh, Socinian. So it came Socinianism. The philosophers that uh, tried to struggle with the origin of evil in our world came up with many different theories. Uh, Kant says it is some unknown, unexplained something in the supersensible sphere. Well, that just means he didn't know. Uh, Leibniz said it was due to the inherent limitations of the material uh, universe. Schleimacher says it's due to the sensual nature of man. And uh, then we have Ritchell, and he said it's due to human ignorance. Bart and very, Bruner are very close to that, in, involved with a system of predestination. And then Alfred North Whitehead has developed a system known as process thought and theology that says sin is inherent in the system that helps to develop both God and men, which I reject very much. The major thrust of the Bible, again, is on redemption, not on the origin and purpose of evil. So you might want to see the systematic theologies for help on the e evil, what we can understand about it, but we really don't know a lot. Now, at this point, I want to mention one really good commentary on Genesis helped me so much. This is loophole on the Old Testament. There are two volumes on Genesis, and this is the first one that I think is so, so significant. Now, let's go to the text, if we could. Uh, chapter 3. Now, now that, that's not really a time element. We're not exactly sure about the time element involved in the Garden of Eden. Some say it was very... Uh, early. Some say Adam and God spent a lot of time together before sin, and I must admit to you, I just really don't know. It, this is not temporal, though. It just means this is what happened. Now, the serpent, and the definite article is with the serpent. Does it mean a particular serpent? Uh, it seems to identify that with a particular creation. Now, the word serpent is the Hebrew word N-A-C-H-A-S-H. -H. There have been several possible uh, etymological derivatives. Number one, some see it comes from the cow stem, meaning hissing. Others say it comes from the PL stem, meaning to whisper, as in a incantation of sorcery or divination. Others say, based on its use in Genesis 4:22, uh, that it means. Um, bright or shiny, like the word bronze used of the serpents in the Exodus experience. Others say it's from the Aramaic root, I mean, excuse me, the Arabic root, which means to creep or slither, meaning the manner of which a snake moves. Uh, but we're just not certain. Now, the idea of the snake being Satan, why didn't it just say Satan instead of a snake? Because it seems to be a very literal snake. You say, well, Bob, why do you think a literal snake talked? Well, here's the reasons I want to mention. First, it is listed as a beast of the field which God created. Second, uh, its punishment uh, it seems to be for a, little, a literal animal, chapter 3, verse 14. And secondly, the New Testament seems to understand it in a very literal sense. 2 Corinthians uh, 11, 3 and 1 Timothy 2.13. Now, why not just mention Satan? Well, very early, I say early, it really wasn't all that early, uh, Satan was identified with this serpent. The first real connection we have is an apocryphal book called Wisdom, which in chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, talk about uh, the serpent being Satan. Uh, in the church, I believe, the first one to mention it would be Irenaeus. And, and then we see it clearly identified in Revelation 12, 9 and 20, verse 2. Well, why not just say Satan up front? Well, it seems that the evil one possessed this particular animal, maybe because of its craftiness, we don't know. 
I, I, I don't see any problem. If, if God can talk through a donkey in Numbers 22, 28, and 30, Satan can talk through a snake. And it's not normal, but I think apparently it can happen. Um, now, I was going <laughs> to... Some of this stuff is so detailed, I can't read all my notes. Uh, the serpent was more crafty. And the word crafty can be from two different uh, Hebrew roots. One meaning crafty, subtle, wise, and the other one meaning prudent. Uh, and it seems to be the root for the name to make naked. And maybe it, it got that term from what it made man feel. I don't know. Then any beast of the field, which shows it's a creation of God, not something supernaturally special, but something in the created order, um, which the Lord God had made. Now, notice the word Lord in all caps is the covenant name for God, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, from the Hebrew verb to be. You might want to see Exodus 3.14. I, it, there's some kind of conflict in the Bible. It seems this word used so early in Genesis, and some people have Yahweh in their vocabulary in the early parts of Genesis. But it seems from uh, Genesis 3 that man didn't call God Yahweh till then. I think the truth is that although man may have called him by this term, he didn't know the full implications of the covenant until the time of Moses. Now the second term is Elohim. It's the plural for the general name for God in the Middle East, El. So Elohim is plural. It usually is translated God, but sometimes it refers to the angels, as I'll show you before we get through this lesson today. When it says Lord God, that's the compound term. The rabbis say that Yahweh speaks of God's mercy and grace and, and, and covenant love, and Elohim is the general name for God, which speaks of God's power and, and creation. I think there's some truth to that. Um, now show, and he said uh, to the woman... Some say the woman should have been surprised that an animal was talking. We don't know what kind of communication existed uh, before the fall between the animals and man. There was great fellowship, and exactly what kind of communication took place, we don't know. Um, now, some have said, well, the woman was away from Adam, and that meant that she was already seeking some kind of self-identity. Friends, you can read... You can read a ton of presuppositions in here if you're looking for them. And boy, you just read the commentaries and you'll see them through the history of interpretation. Let's try to say what it says here without drawing too many conclusions from our imagination. Now, we're all going to do it some, but be careful, okay? I don't know why she was by herself, but she was. I don't know why the serpent tempted her. Some say because Adam had the original command in chapter 2, 16 and 17, and Adam told Eve, and so Eve got second-hand knowledge. That may be true. We just can't base a whole lot on that. And the serpent uses the word Elohim instead of the word Yahweh. And the rabbis say he couldn't use the word Yahweh because that's God's mercy, and he knows nothing about that. I don't know why he uses the word Elohim by itself, but he does. So the serpent said, God has said... And it, there's a question here, but it, it's, a, it's an unusual Hebrew form, which means it's not a, the normal way of asserting a question, but it's kind of like he's making a statement, but in the statement is an allusion to a question. God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. Implication, did he say that? Now, the reference here, of course, is to the one restriction that God put on, on man. Now, why he put that restriction is apparently to see if man would choose to trust him and love him and obey him. Now, we're going to get into, was there magical powers in the tree? I think not. Uh, the idea was it was on God's one prohibition. Now, and the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. Well, what she's saying is we can eat all the tree except these, these couple of ones. Uh, but from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. Now back from chapter 2 verse 9, there are two trees. There's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now apparently both of these trees being in the midst of the garden says the garden had some boundaries. Number two, they were central in this whole account. It seems to imply that at the proper time man would have been allowed to eat of these trees for they seem to have an eschatological significance. The tree of life is very common in all of the creation accounts both of Sumeria and Babylon and Persia. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is unique to the Bible. There are so many unique elements. You say, well, why is there such uh, parallel accounts in many ways? I personally believe that man uh, passed down these traditions for a long time until the Tower of Babel when man was dispersed. And then when man was dispersed, traditional uh, um, varieties of this original story began to develop. And that's where these uh, different accounts came from. 
Now, notice where it mentions, from the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it, nor you shall touch it. Now, this is, this is an amplification of what God said in 2.17. Uh, and, of course, she only heard it from Adam. She seems to add some intensity. Some have said, well, that means she didn't think it's fair that God should say you couldn't eat it. She's saying he didn't say you couldn't even touch it to intensify that. We can't read the psychological motives in Genesis' account as we can't any other structure here. Now, lest you'll die. Now, how did they know what death was? Apparently, death hadn't entered the world. I don't know what they understood, uh, but it was, a, it was fearful enough that, that they were willing to say, she didn't want no part of it, that you will die. And so the serpent said, woman, you surely shall not die. Now, this is unique in Hebrew structure. It's a very unusual way of saying it. Not only has the serpent put into the woman's mind to think something evil about God's nature or God's veracity or God's goodness, but he is going to... Um, absolutely say God is not telling you the truth here. He's going to call God a liar. And the structure of the Hebrew intensifies. That's not true, what God has said. Okay? I bet it's surprising when it's something in creation would deny God. Uh, Surely you shall not die. Now, there are three kinds of death in the Bible. I, it must have surprised uh, Eve when she ate and didn't die. Back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, 17, it says, A soul that sins shall die. You eat the tree, you'll die. And yet they were still alive. Maybe some say the serpent pushed Eve to touch it, and when she didn't die by touching it, it was an evidence that God wasn't telling the truth. I don't know if that's true. The second kind of death in the Bible, obviously is spiritual death, a relationship between God and man was broken, resulted in physical death. We see it so clearly in Genesis chapter 5. And if spiritual death is not taken care of before physical death, we see about the second death or eternal death or damnation, which we see in Revelation 26 and 14. For God knows in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Not only did he talk about the nature of God, he was saying he kind of is keeping you from these good things. He's not real fair, is he? Then it's a direct denial of God's word. All this temptation focuses on the person and word and promise and trustworthiness of God. And so that now he says, God's just trying to keep you from this. He doesn't want you to be, have your eyes open. He's trying to keep you from something good. The implication was God at the proper time would have given man this. But man uh, grabbed it away from God. And that's the problem, this egocentric, prideful stance. Now when it said, uh, his eyes were open, boy they were, but not in the way. See, Satan tells half-truths. Uh, they did get new knowledge, but boy, it wasn't knowledge they thought it was going to be. Now, you'll be like God is the word Elohim. There are some places where Elohim is used of the spiritual realm, like Psalms 8, 5, and 6, quoted in Hebrews 2, 7. Maybe it says you'll be like the angels. Or be a, uh, you'll be like the supernatural beings is a way in saying you're going to be fully God. You'll be like one of the angels. Isn't it funny that man grasp after equality with the angelic world when it, from further revelation we know that man was already higher than the angelic world, closer to God? And yet he grabbed that which was already his. Now, that's exactly what Philippians 2, 6 through 11 says about Jesus. He didn't grab the things that he had, but was uh, submissive to the Father in the appropriate place. Now, um, so here we have the woman denying God's love, God's nature, God's provision, God's care, God's truthfulness, and God's word. And boy, it's going to issue uh, in terrible things. So woman saw the tree was good for food. Satan can only tempt. Uh, the girl started looking at it and thinking about it, and it moved from the seed bed of the heart to the seed bed of the you know the eyes and the thoughts, and it issued out in, in the sin. Now notice where it mentions here. Then saw that the tree was good for food. There was delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate it. Now the deal about the apple is probably untrue. There were no apples in this part of the world. The rabbis say it was a fig tree and that's where they got the leaves to cover themselves. A fig or a date or some kind of uh, fruit is possible. Uh, apparently it was a unique kind of tree. There weren't, the, there weren't other kinds of this same tree in the garden. So whatever it was, it was one of a kind here. Some say it was a magical fruit. Here's the pagan mythological background. I don't think the fruit was magical. It was the fact that God put some prohibition. It was God's word that made this, this fruit unique. And she gave it to her husband. Her husband also ate. There's been a lot of talk here. The rabbis say, uh, well, uh, she loved, he loved her and was afraid not to follow after her, that he would lose her. I think we can't, can't read that into this. Um, 
this same thing comes from Milton in the lit English literature as comes the rabbis about putting some kind of noble thought on Adam. I think Eve acted to Adam as the sa Satan had acted to her. And the fact that she was still alive and had eaten it and apparently, you know, wasn't dead encouraged Adam to go ahead and follow her, his wife to be like God. Now, um, and their eyes of both them were opened. Yeah, but what kind of opened it was? You might want well to see Titus 1, 15. It, their new knowledge corrupted everything. And they knew they were naked. Now, that shows they moved from innocence into a, into a different state. This doesn't mean that sin is moving from childhood to adulthood. It simply is talking about the first account here. Um, from now on, the mask, man's going to wear a mask. He's going to be estranged from himself. He's going to be estranged from his spouse. He's going to be estranged from nature. And God help us, he's going to be estranged from God. They were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves. Now, this isn't huge leaves like the ones found in India. It just means they twined fig leaves together because they were there to make a girdle, a loincloth for themselves. Um, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the garden. Now, the word sound in King James means voice, but the Hebrew word seems to imply uh, the idea of the sound of him walking. This is very anthropomorphic, for God does not have a body. Some have assumed that God appeared to Adam and Eve the way uh, the pre-incarnate Jesus appeared in the form of the angel of the Lord. That may be true, taking on a human form to, to uh, have some kind of limited fellowship with him. Uh, but he does not normally have a body. God is spirit and he does not have a body. So we talk about him as if he was a man having a body, but in reality he doesn't. Now what does it mean, the cool of the day? Well, that means the day when the breeze came. Some think it's morning, most think it's evening in the Middle East when a cool breeze comes just before that. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God. And I want to tell you, they've been hiding themselves ever since. Isn't it a tragedy they were afraid of God? That's exactly what sin has done for us. It has made us afraid of the very one who loves us. It has made us uh, fearful of the one who is doing everything he can to bring us back to himself. Guilt and shame have done that. They were hiding uh, from the presence of the Lord. You might want to see Revelation 6:16 6, there. And the Lord God called to man and said, Where are you? Now God knew where he was. He knew all about this before he created the earth. It's a way of, uh, of teaching man what he had done. Okay, it's a, and that's it. Kind of, it's a um, a form of a question to help man realize. And he said, "I heard the sound of thee in the garden. I was afraid. Oh my goodness, because I was naked." Now this, I was naked, is a cover up for the real problem. It wasn't the fact he was naked. That's not why he was hiding from God. It's because he had he had eaten the fruit, and the guilt and shame resulted from that. So he's already making excuses. Um, and he said, "Who told you you were naked?" And have you eaten from the tree which I command you not to eat? Again, these are questions for God knew full well the answer, but wanted man to become re responsible. And the man said, The woman that thou gavest me, she gave from the tree and I ate. Well, here's the passing the buck already. We see the full-blown fruit of sin. First of all, the man, man's responsible. That's why I think Satan's not mentioned by name. We're not trying to take away from the fact that man's responsible. Flip Wilson theology won't cut it. Man is going to stand before God on his own. Satan content, but he can't force. And so I think the serpent here is kind of a stand-in for Satan to show man and emphasize man's responsibility. But look what man says. It's this woman that you gave me. Implication, it's her fault. And it's your fault for giving her to me. Oh, really? Ain't that the pits? And so God turns to the woman. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And there's an intensification in the Hebrew like here. What have you done? <laughs> and the woman said, The snake did it. <laughs> Boy, this is passing the buck par excellence. The poor snake has no one to blame it on. He's one was possessed by evil. So he gets it in the neck. Uh, the word deceive me here is the word cause to forget. Now the rabbis say that the, that the Satan and Eve had a sexual relationship. Well that goes back to one of these presuppositions that the idea there's something sexual about them thinking they were naked and all that. I don't think there's anything sexual here. This is not, not the physical temptation except that she saw the tree was good. It's psychological temptation. It's man being slowly drawn away from the promises and the provisions and obedience to the Word of God. And that's what we see all the way through here. And I think it's, it, it's a tragedy. So we find, uh, we start out with God and man and perfect fellowship. 
God has brought uh, Eve to man. We don't know how long they enjoyed God's presence in each other. And then suddenly, slowly but surely, the wedge of self-willed, egotistical pride comes into this. And they are drawn into themselves away from God. Instead of being dependent on someone who loved and provided them so wonderfully, they wanted independence. But independence was in itself the sin of the evil one. And so in, in a, this self-love, uh, this egotistical, centristic nature that we certainly have, even innocent, is what this is all about. I really think one of the reasons uh, it, it, for a millennium is going to be that man is going to be put back in a perfect setting again, even with the Messiah's presence, and even with the presence of the Messiah, and the presence where evil will be out of the way, Satan will be chained apparently, Man's still going to rebel. That's what this is all about. Innocence. Man keeps telling God, it, it's your fault. It, it's environment. It's temptation. No. Deep in the heart of every one of us is that pull towards self. And that's what we have here. Now, many modern people think it's an allegory. Uh, some think it's just mythological. I, I tend to take it very, very much more literally. But I think, again, the way you interpret this is not as significant as that you catch the major truths here, that man is alienated from God, but that God is doing everything he can to bring man back to himself. And the way God has chosen is to die on man's behalf and to give it as a free gift back to man through faith and repentance in Jesus Christ. This sets the stage for the whole process of redemption. The whole rest of the Bible is ununderstandable apart from this. We'll cover the consequence of the fall next week. I've enjoyed being with you. God bless you. Have a good day.